doctor, cure yourself. And I will say, do also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there are many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine in all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And there were also many lepers in Israel the time of, during, in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may see. Bow our heads in prayer again. Love, Lord, is what you give to us. Love, the greatest gift of all. Amen. Well, I'm not as grouchy as I used to be. I'm not as intolerant as I used to be. I'm not as rigid as I used to be. It used to be that if a young couple were planning a wedding and they came to me and they indicated to me that they wanted 1 Corinthians to be read at their wedding, I would secretly sigh and say to myself, not again, not, not again. And sadly, I can no longer hear today's text without thinking of the movie, The Wedding Crashers. Have any of you watched that movie? In this box office, Kit Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn play best friends who crash wedding parties as a way to date women, as a way to pick up women. And they do so by developing elaborate cover stories to charm the crowd and then to just simply be the light the wedding party. In one of the early scenes, the two are at a wedding party, and when the pastor announces that the bride's sister will now read scripture, Owen turns to Vince and he says, $20, 1 Corinthians. To which Vince replies, double or nothing, Colossians 3.12. And uh, like Owen, I think my money would have been on, on 1 Corinthians. And sure enough, when the bride's sister got up to read, it was 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. You know this because no doubt you've heard it at a wedding, right? You know it because maybe you had it as a reading for your wedding. I think that um, this is one of the best known passages in the Bible because of its use in weddings. And it's easier, it's easy to understand why people choose this. It's very easy. Because it represents one of the most beautiful expressions of love found in the Bible. But guess what? It wasn't meant for weddings. Paul did not write this for weddings. When it comes to love, you see, the Greeks didn't have just one word for it, they had at least three words for it. They had the word eros for love, and we get our word erotic from that. But don't worry, uh, this isn't going to be dirty or anything like that. Eros love is a wonderful thing. It is love based on the qualities the lover sees in the beloved. John meets Mary. And John is taken back by the 
way Mary pushes her hair back behind her ear before she begins to speak. John is taken aback by the way Mary bites her lower lip. John is taken aback by the way Mary, when she eats, she cuts her piece of meat into thousands of little pieces and then chews those pieces thousands of times. John is taken aback by the way Mary tilts her head when she listens to him. John is taken aback by the way Mary talks about her fourth grade class that she teaches. John is taken aback by the way she takes his hand when they walk together. And the more John sees of Mary, the more of these things that he finds of her that he is taken aback by. And if he's lucky, if he's lucky, then Mary is seeing things in John that fascinates her too. And if you watch The Bachelor, I mean, come on, how many of you watch? I know some of you watch The Bachelor. You watch The Bachelor. I know you do. This is what we hear of on television. We hear of Eros type of love. We hear of this romantic. Don't look at me like you haven't seen The Bachelor for crying out loud. <laughs> this is romantic love. And it is one of life's most marvelous gifts. This is the kind of love at the heart of any marriage. It is love based on the qualities of the other. But the word in 1 Corinthians is not this type of love. Another word for love that the Greeks had was philia, which is literally brotherly love. I suppose we could say sisterly love as well. It is the love that colleagues who work together or friends who play together develop for each other in the course of their lives, in the course of their joys and of their struggles. Think of Philadelphia. What does that mean? It means simply the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. When the Super Bowl is over next week, you will hear guys talking on the winning team about how much they love each other. And they do. But it is not in the same way that Mary loves John. Now, 1 Corinthians is all about love, but it doesn't use the word eros love, and it doesn't use the word philia love. It uses the third word for love, which is agape love. Agape love. It is a love based solely, a love based solely on the disposition of the lover to love. So notice this. Without any qualities of the beloved, agape love is solely placed on the disposition of the lover to love. So you don't get agape love because you're lovable. You don't get agape love because you have outstanding qualities. You don't deserve agape love. Deserving is beside the point. You get agape love because the lover gives it to you. Just gives it. It is a gift. So let me say two things about agape love. It is freely given. It isn't earned, it's given. And the second thing about agape love is that it does not end. It cannot end because it is based on the character of the lover, not on the deserving of the beloved. It lasts forever. This love never ends. And this love is God's greatest gift to you. Agape love. So this famous passage, this wonderful passage about God's love is God's gift to us. 
And only after, only after this passage has been described as the agape love of God for us, for you, for me, only after this has been written in stone, the truth that I am loved and that you are loved by God, can we and can the text begin to talk about us as lovers and about you as lovers. This kind of godly love is beyond us, but we reach toward it. I remember Tiger Woods always saying that his goal as a golfer is a round of 18. That's his goal, a round of 18. Impossible, probably, but he pressed on toward it just the same. So my goal is to become as good a lover as God is of me. And that's what it means to be growing in Christ, to be growing in the Lord. William Shakespeare said, pretend a virtue if you have it not. Pretend a virtue if you have it not. In other words, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. You don't feel very loving? Do the loving thing anyway. Don't feel being very kind? Do something kind anyway, because God has been kind to you. Don't feel very patient? Take your breath and do the patient thing, because God has been patient toward you and with you. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Pretend a virtue if you have it not. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but now I have put away childish ways. You see, we are always growing in this love of the Lord. We are always growing into this love of the Lord. Think it till you make it. We who are growing in the love of the Lord are growing in faith. We who are growing in the love of the Lord learn that through faith we are loved by the Lord, that we are loved in the Lord, and that we love ourselves and anybody else with the Lord because we are the Lord's. We who are growing in the love of the Lord, we know how to pray. What a friend we have in Jesus, right? We who are growing in the love of the Lord, we know how to pray, and we know the power of prayer. We know the power of it, and we know the Word of God, and we know the truth of God. When you grow in the Lord, the Lord speaks with you, and when you grow in the Lord, the Lord speaks to you. And when you grow in the Lord, the Lord speaks through you. We who are growing in the Lord, we can be honest with God, and we can be honest with ourselves, and we can be honest with others. We who are growing in the Lord realize that we can overlook the faults of others because we have some faults of our own. We who are growing in the Lord can have respect for people whose views are different than our own because we have put away our childish ways, right? We've put them away. We who are growing in the Lord, we learn to forgive. We who are growing in the Lord, we know that we are not perfect, but that we are overcoming. We are growing in the Lord. So when we fall down in the Lord, we are able to get back up again. Growing in the Lord. I am a work in progress. You are a work in progress. We are all growing in the Lord. And as we grow in the Lord, as we put away childish things, as we lose interest in childish interests and mindsets and behaviors, we embrace a perspective that is based on God's love for us and God's love that is flowing through us. That is a genuine, healthy love for ourselves and a spirit-directed and empowered love for others. As we grow in the Lord, we take on respect rather than rudeness. As we grow in the Lord, we develop a sense of justice for others, even if we have to fight for that justice of others. As we grow in the Lord, we lose tolerance 
for power plays, and we begin to seek after and rejoice in God's grace. As we grow in the Lord, let me ask you a question. Are you growing in the Lord? Are you growing in the Lord? Have you put away childish things and childish mindsets and childish ways? Are you growing in the Lord? I don't care how young you are. You are growing in the Lord. I don't care how old you are. You are growing in the Lord. In the Lord. Remember, if you're not dead, then you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. I don't care. Are you growing in the Lord? We've got time to watch an hour of Bachelor, right? Do we have time to come to church for an hour? We've got time to watch HGTV on how to decorate our homes. Do we have time to attend a Bible study? Because God's love 